Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's having a great week. I'm happy to be here today and share a little bit of my journey. Um, 20 years of being in the food business. I still try to feel like a kid, but I see a lot of faces already that remind me of myself when I first started. Um, today, I wanna just make it fun and interactive. If you wanna throw questions uh, within the chat, <clears throat> Adrian will take a look at most of them. And if I see something interesting or something that I can stop and pause, I, I will do so. Um, I don't have anything specific designed to, to share with you on screen. I thought, you know, I would first start by just telling you a little bit about my journey. Um, and then from there, ask, answer any questions that could be relevant to yours and see how I can help you become a better, uh, a better founder, a better partner, um, with not only your, your teams, but your retailers and your, your investors. Um, to make it real simple, I started off uh, about 20 years ago. I graduated from the University of Maryland, and I could not get a job uh, with a Maryland degree at the time. Now it's really hard to get into Maryland, but uh, leaving the business school, I would go on interviews, and I was either you know too excited about the future of my boss's job than I was about the current job they were offering me and ultimately led me to, to go into the insurance space. And what's relevant about this part of my history is like everything else in life, you know, when I got the job, there was about a hundred other young uh, executives that were told to write 120 names of people that they knew that they could call to try to get appointments so that the partners of the firm can go and meet those people. And the reality is when I asked that question, maybe 10% or less of those people actually survive, but the firm gets to keep all those clients. And where everyone else in that executive class started and ran to their desks to start calling everyone they knew, I went into the top partner's office and I said, I don't wanna learn how to sell insurance. I want to learn what success looks like. And for me to pick up a phone and pretend as if I know everything from just two weeks of seminars is crazy. So for the first six months of that job, I went around with the top guy and I learned everything that he did that was important to his clients. And after every meeting, what I learned was no one really cared what he was selling. They cared about the relationship that he was providing. And what he would do when he would walk into a meeting is he would look around the room and see what was important to that person, whether it was their kids, whether it was cars, whether it was vacations. And he would spend a lot of time building that rapport and that relationship. So when he would call them a week later and talk about insurance, the first thing that client would say is, oh shit, what is Andy calling me on? And he would ask how John did on his baseball game or how Susie did it at her dance recital. And at the end of the call, he would say, okay, I'll talk to you later. And the person would say, wait a minute, I want to talk about the insurance. So he made it less about what he was selling and more about being trusted and being likable. And why I say that's important is when I got into the uh, food business, uh, my first brand was a biscotti business. I would go into retailers and some of the best retailers in the world, and I would come in with no presentation and no product. And I would take that same approach and I would say to that Costco buyer, for example, you are the biggest and best buyer in the world with my particular products. I'm two weeks into my new brand. I know nothing about this space other than what I think I know. Could you take me downstairs to your floor? I want to spend 20 minutes hearing everything about what you've done successful, the brands that you've partnered with, the items that are doing really well, and what are the holes in your system that I could potentially provide a solution for? And I would say half thought I was crazy and would tell me to leave. And the other half that thought this was interesting took it upon themselves to spend 30 minutes bragging about all their successes, telling me about their failures, and I would tell them some of the things that I was working on. And then we'd come back to their office. I'd show them some things that I was doing and we'd build a better mousetrap. And the reason why that was so important is one, I was establishing that I trusted them 
And I wanted them to trust me that I was going to take their advice and one plus one in my mind would equal three. So when I would come back to them a week or two later, it was a project that wasn't just mine, it was something that was theirs. So when we would go into the store and we would first start off and not everything starts off like a rocket ship, they would have some vested interest in trying to help me gain success. They'd give me those free end caps. They talked to me about promotions that worked. Um, they would talk to me about maybe changing flavors or changing pack sizes or changing um, price points instead of looking at me and saying, you're on the bottom half of our success and we need to replace you with somebody else. They wanted me to succeed because I was taking their advice. So first and foremost, um, as a young founder is don't be afraid to share with the community that you're working with that you are new and that they're a lot smarter than you and they've been there a lot longer than you and that they could give you good insights that you'll listen. And the best part is when you actually activate and you do the things that they're asking you to do, they give you more and more opportunities. And what makes you unique versus big companies like Kellogg's or Kraft is the person who's walking into those meetings can't do any of those things I just described. They are told by marketing, they're told by operations, they're told by a boss who has five other bosses that it's this color, this size, this price point, and this is all we can do. So what you give as an advantage to a retailer is that you are in the captain's seat. You have the opportunity to change your destiny as well as theirs by creating things that big companies just don't want to do just yet. So that's one example on how you know I kind of came in early on and used some of my understandings on relationships to do a business that was more as a word, relationship versus transaction. Um, to go back to my, I guess, my, my early stages of my first brand, um, just to give you a little bit of that journey, when I was selling insurance, my first client sold his business. We went to a Chinese restaurant. We got the Chinese fortune cookie. And we said, there's just as many Italian restaurants as there are Chinese. Why don't we create an Italian fortune cookie? And because I was selling insurance and he was a pharmaceutical guy, we were naive enough to think that that would work. So we went to uh, upstate New York. We created a biscotti, uh, which at the time was uh, unique to the marketplace and was synonymous with selling a coffee. We made little messages inside that would say, when your ship came in, make sure you're not waiting at the airport. And I hired a former Godiva uh, designer to create a really cool packaging. We walked into our first distributor and we were offering this product at 50 cents that he would sell for a dollar that a restaurant would give away for free. And Chris Pappas, who owns Dairyland, looked at me and says, you're absolutely nuts. You should go back to insurance. I'm never going to sell this to a bunch of Italian restaurant owners in New York City on Canal Street without getting thrown in the river for offering them something that they would actually not make money on. So I left kind of upset but we went to the New York style restaurant show just to give the product away. I was just as frustrated as probably most founders here that I just couldn't figure out how to get things going. Towards the end of the show, when the lights come on and they say the bar is open and everyone's running out to leave and you've made no sales, a chef came by and he said he's opening up a hotel this is in 2001 uh, in the desert. They were looking for something that wouldn't melt on their pillows. And it was the Venetian Hotel in Las Vegas. And he ordered 150,000 of these in my last hour of what I thought would be my journey into food. So typically when it's your last chance, when you think you're almost out, um, that's usually when luck starts to strike. Um, our product was at the opening of the hotel. We get a call from Catherine Zeta-Jones, who I don't know if any of you know who she is, but she married Michael Douglas in 2002 or 2001 at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. And it was the first million dollar wedding that a celebrity would pay. This is before Instagram and all social media. And we got written up in People Magazine as this new cool cookie that was at their wedding with little messages inside. And long story short, we get a call from Starbucks um, and they were looking for something that they could put 
next to their coffee. And um, we ended up uh, building a plant in upstate New York, partnering with Kellogg's after that and selling the business to a private equity firm in Chicago. So in a very short period of time, we're thinking, you know, things are bleak and it's not going to happen for you. You know, we figured out at the end of that journey how to teach the uh, Keebler elves how to sell cookies. So as I could tell anyone on this call, any, anything is possible. Um, when we sold that business, I went to the plant the next day. I thought I had a job. They told me I didn't. We were signed up for a uh, show in Europe. Uh, they told me I can keep the tickets and keep the plane tickets. I went anyway. And I got introduced to a supplier in Spain that was making pellet snacks, meaning taking macaroni and expanding it into a shape of a snack. They said 90% of the snacks in Europe are made that way. Only 2% of the snacks in the U.S. are made that way. Went back to my first couple customers, Costco, Sam's, and uh, Trader Joe's, told them about this concept. I invited them to a plant that I was about to uh, manufacture my products in in Pennsylvania. I showed them this product. They said, why don't you call it a veggie straw instead of a veggie flute? And uh, in a very short period of time, I created the NASCAR approach where I gave everyone the same product, which is the product behind me. It was a 16 ounce bag, sea salt. I said, I can't control everyone's margins or marketing of what they do in their stores, but I can give each of you the same price and same product. I can give you something that's differentiated than anything that Frito-Lay or any of the other guys are selling. And if I can get all three of you to buy my product, I can give you a price point that matches what those guys would be willing to sell you Doritos at. The word veg veggie straws came to the point that, you know, these were made with potatoes and vegetable purees, so it tasted like a potato chip. And in a four-year period, we grew that to about 100 million in sales and just three customers um, with about 10 million at EBITDA. And what we learned from that experience was the amount of marketing and demonstrations that we did within the club stores when we opened up the product to retail in a very crowded uh, space, we didn't need to do as many promotions and marketing dollars because people were just excited to see flavor extensions of our product. And because we had so much household penetration through club, it made it a lot easier for us to actually, for people to see us on shelf at retail. And that was opposite of what everyone else was doing. Everyone else said, you guys are crazy. You're going to go out of business. Why are you doing it this way? And what I found is a lot of our competitors were very um, anxious to get products in places where their investors shopped or their investors' families shopped. And at the end of the day, while I love you know, my natural partners, um, especially when I first started, uh, the velocities and the sizes of their retailers expansions, the biggest snacks in their stores did maybe four or five million dollars in sales. The biggest uh, snacks in, in club were doing 100 million in sales. So if I'm going to build an organization or a structure around a business, I needed to make sure that middle America would be excited about what I was doing as much as people in New York and L.A. Because for me to be able to stay in business means I have to build velocities, I have to gain EBITDA, I have to have a good team, and I have to make money. So, um, so that's another very important point for you to recognize is as you're building your business, is, is there enough interest in what you're doing to attract a big enough audience to support a brand? Or is it just a hobby? And I know that's probably a hard thing to get your hands around, but if you're going to stay in business and maintain enough equity of your business, you got to stop raising money at some point. Um, and you need to find uh, opportunities where your business can grow beyond just your peripheral first customers. I don't know if any of that makes, makes any sense, but I'm happy to you know, start taking questions. Um, I could talk about some other brands that, that we've built, but you know, at the end of the day, I would, you know, another, you know, before we go there, you know, one of the questions a lot of people ask me is like, how do you, how do you find good people or, or when is the right time to hire people? And I always say this, you know, when I first started out, you know, my wife uh, was my girlfriend at the time we were at a trade show in Orlando and I hired basically the geriatric sales team of the 1970s. 
right? And I was the youngest. I was like a 24 year old kid, and everyone at my table was like 70. And my wife said to me, What the hell are you doing with all these people? And I said, Well, this is what I can afford. And she said, Well, instead of hiring five, you know, people who are really good 25 years ago, why don't you find one really great person? Someone that you can actually learn from that's relevant in the industry today and has contacts that um, they really um, want to see. So I sat down and I thought about that and I started to interview people. And some of the questions that I would ask in an interview were, you know, what do you think of my brand, right? Everyone would say, oh, I love it. You know, this is great. I think it can do a lot with it. And then I would ask them, who are their, who are their best customers? And I'll make an example, Kroger. And I would say, okay, who's the buyer at Kroger? And they would say, Steve. And they would tell me how much them and their team did with, with Kroger. And I would say, great. Can you, who's the Kroger buyer again? Stacy. Can you get Stacy on the phone? Can you text her right now? And they would look at me and say, are you, what, what do you mean? I, well, you said you had a great relationship with her. Let's find out if she thinks that this is as good as you do and if she'll take an appointment if I hire you. And you'll find, well, it's really my broker who has the relationship with Stacy, or, you know, I managed a team of 150 people and I really wasn't in touch with that person. And after a number of interviews, when you find that person who understands that in order for you to be successful with your brand and your investors is you need at the end of the day, proof of concept and you need distribution. And you need someone who's trusting not just you, but they're looking at Darren that you just hired, who just came off of Skinny Pop and was doing 100 million in retail. And they're like, why did you leave Skinny Pop? It's because Veggie Strolls is gonna be the next biggest thing and I wanna be on that train, right? And then they're like, all right, come in, I wanna see you. So finding you know, the right person, everyone has what looks like to be a great resume, but you really want the person who can literally in that meeting, text that buyer, has that friendship, has been to parties, weddings, bat mitzvahs, whatever it took for them to be successful and know who that buyer is. And it's typically the people who have worked for very small organizations. The brokers that work for these big conglomerates, they get paid sixty-five to $70,000 a year and they get a bonus. Doesn't matter what they sell. Some of them will do really good jobs, but the majority of them have no reason to sell your product over another product. However, there are brokers out there that own their own business. They have the same P&Ls as you, they have the same overhead, and they have the same reason to take in more revenue or more opportunities because they either have investors themselves or they wanna make real money. So when I take on a broker who's representing my brands, that business, if he loses distribution of this water, it hurts his personal pocket. He doesn't have 17 other waters to rely on. He chose this one to be the exclusive water broker or opportunity. So it's really important as a small emerging brand to align yourself with the people who have the same risk rewards as you do in your stage of your brands. Now I'll shut up for a second. And that's great advice. Um, not about always what you know, but who you know. Relationship building is definitely key. Um, would love to hear from some of our guests here. I mean, this is a Meet the Founder Hour, meant to be very casual. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. Sure, Jason would like to we do have something here. Um, do you have advice for a white label? private label, sales to retail. An example, a company that can offer many different products. How do you recommend the cadence of sending information to retail buyers and not overwhelming them? That's a great question. So if I'm, if I'm understanding the question right, it's they have a brand and they can also offer private label. Is that is that what they're asking? They're asking for advice on how to offer many different products or recommend the cadence of sending the information to the retail buyers, but not overwhelming them. So it comes back to, as I mentioned before, is a lot of people ask me today, it's okay, so I wanna go see, I'll use 
I've been using Costco as a great example. I want to go see Costco. I want to sell Costco. And I sell, tell people it's, to me, it's, it's a relationship and not a transaction. If you're just going to send over a, a whole skew of products that you can make, it becomes transactional, right? It becomes a commodity. Um, it's your potato chip versus somebody else's. But what I like to do is, and I've gotten that access because I built those relationships and the brokers around me have as well, is when I find someone who has a lot of capabilities or a lot of great opportunities, you got to align yourself with someone who that retailer already trusts and does great business with. So I would say to, to that retailer, I have all these great innovations and opportunities that's going to drive more consumers into your stores where you have all these other areas where people can now look to try to find products, whether it's online, whether it's across the street. And I really am in love with what you guys do. And I have a passion to try to help retailers do better. Can I get an hour to just share all the different capabilities and things that we, that we can do for you? And go in there and understand and ask the questions of, not that I can just sell this potato chip, but what are some of the things in your portfolio at your store that you feel that you're not getting the right supply of? Maybe they have potato chips, but they don't get them as consistently as they want to. Or maybe they get some, a lot of spoils or a bunch of recalls. Brag about the little things that you can do in order to shift that buyer to realize that it's not just, I can save you 10 cents on this, but I can also create flavors and help you do things that maybe your current supplier can't do. So try to first go in if you don't have that relationship with someone who has a great relationship there, who's vetted you. So that buyer is asking less questions about, can you really do this? And more of, I wanna know why Jason brought you here today or John or Stacey or Jim brought you here today. They obviously think you can help me. We have a couple more questions. Um, they want, Kevin would like to know uh, or hear some recent examples of brands that have caught your eye and you think are doing extremely well. Oh God, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a good one. But I would say, you know, there is a lot of great brands out there that really understand that uh, consumers today are identifying products differently than how I would say I built products 10, 20 years ago. They're getting very much engaged socially. Um, they're using, whether it's Be Verified or TikTok or Snap, but they're also being very transparent and truthful to their audience. They're not trying to be everything for everyone, but they are trying to build a crowdsource funding um, or crowdsource um, excitement around the brand so that before they even launch, they've got a number of people already talking about the brand. Um, one of the brands that did this really well that I was involved with was Owen. Um, they really went after the niche at first of going after allergen free. And there was a lot of people doing it for, for marketability reasons, but they took it a step further where they tested their product multiple times pre trial, uh, pre-production, post-production. They posted all those results on their websites or on their, on their feed so that the consumer who was really concerned about those, those issues recognized that the company was doing these things. And when you do this price point to those consumers is irrelevant because it's safety first, right? If they have a cross-contamination issue, um, they can get sick or die, right? So they're looking for brands that are really putting, um, putting that energy and effort to give that consumer that, uh, that comfort. Going back a little bit towards uh, relationship building, as a newer company, who would you say would be the most strategic partner? Like what kind of network should you be establishing first? So first, you know, obviously, you know, organizations like this, there's a lot of great, you know, people within, you know, naturally or at a lot of the uh, expos. We've got one of the best industries where 
people who are successful want to help other people. It's not one of these where I have a secret and I'm not going to share it. Um, so first and foremost, networking through events like this are, are tremendous and, and do, do great things. Um, I tell people all the time, I use um, headhunters not only just to find new talent, but let's say you know we're launching when we first got involved with beverage, I did 10 different snack brands. I knew a lot, but I didn't know everything about beverage. I went to places like Forest Brand and I knew I had to hire people, but I would just interview 10, 20, 30 people and hear all their different experiences from whether it was buy, whether it was core, whether it was vitamin water, just to learn a lot of bit, a lot of different things about how different cultures and different brands went to market. You don't have to hire everyone you interview, but you're going to get a little piece from each and every person. And then you're going to bump into that right person that just fits all those boxes from through all those interviews. The other place that I go is when I go to a retailer, I'll say, who is the best person that you know for granola bars? And then you ask three or four other retailers, and usually they'll come up with, you've asked for five names, you'll start hearing the same names or the same brokers over and over again. So if you listen to the advice of your industry and the people that are going to be buying from you, and now you're buying trusted people that, you know, you're, you're hiring trusted people that they work with, and you call them and say, hey, great news, you know, so-and-so took the job. Thank you so much for recommending that person. How could they not buy your product now? You just invested in, in, in uh, infrastructure that they recommended. They're not going to take a meeting with that person. So a lot of times I try to align, you know, that one plus one equals three, where I'm utilizing, you know, my retailers. Uh, same thing with, with manufacturing, co -patterns. What ops people have worked really well in your plan, right? So if I am a new brand and I can't get the attention of that supply chain, but so-and-so from that big popcorn company comes in and he's like, I know everyone in that plant. You know, we went from zero to a hundred million and we're going to do that again with your brand. And now all of a sudden that person didn't want to take your call. It's like, holy shit, these three people are on your team. Like, sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't pay attention. So sometimes you have to utilize other strengths of other people when you're first starting out to build validity within your own organization. We have a lot of questions rolling in here, so I'm just trying to get to everything. Um, <clears throat> the next one will be a little bit more specific about veggie straws. It's a two-part question. So the first being, how is veggie straws able to meet a club price point when you were just starting out and didn't have scale? And then the second part is, uh, what percentage of sales is e-commerce, D2C? Um, and have you, what's your experience with using Amazon if you're currently advertising on it? Um, anyway. Sure. So I was I was uh, part of Veggie Strauss from 2005 through 2011. So there was no e-commerce back then. Thank God we didn't have another another channel to get yelled at about. But um, so to start off with Club, with the the mystery and what people don't understand is if I want to sell veggie straws or any product into a uh, just use ShopRite, for example. If I wanted to be a dollar on shelf at ShopRite, I would have to sell the product probably for 40, 50 cents to a distributor who would then sell the product for 65 to 70 cents to the retailer. And if I'm lucky, the retailer is at a dollar, okay? If I sell the same product to Club, at 70 cents, they're gonna retail that product at 79 cents. So the mystery that I'm actually cutting my margins or making it more difficult for myself to sell the club, it's actually more expensive to put the same product in grocery. I'm giving both of them about a 10 to 15% spend on top of that. So my margins even shrink more when it comes to retail. Um, we were selling a, 20 ounce bag for $4.99. And because the volume that they were giving us was anywhere from five to $50 million a year in business, 
we were able to buy a lot of product for a very short period of runs. So we were able to either buy down line time quite inexpensively, or we were able to use the power of the club volume to be able to get our pricing so low from our suppliers that it gave us profitability in grocery. So we would use a lot of the profits from that channel to invest in slotting, to invest in promotions and marketing that typically you would have to go call uh, investors to raise more capital so that you had those dollars. So for us, we saw a club as uh, twofold. One was we can get the product in a store where people can try it. And if your product tastes good and club, because you'll know within days of what the reaction was on those demos, it's a lot less expensive to try something there than put a half a million dollars in UNFI, get it on a shelf at a grocery store and find out six months later that it didn't move, right? So we would be able to tweak or recognize, well, we've got a tiger by the tail. This is like blowing out. The consumer really wants it, or this is the wrong product. And thank God we didn't put this anywhere else because it's just not moving yet. In terms of, I guess, to answer a question on, on today's environment with, with, with uh, e-com, we use e-com as a great vehicle, like we did with Club, to understand elasticity, price points, buzzwords, consumers' response. And because we can see you know, purchase frequency, we can get a good indication from e-com as to whether or not a product will work at retail. We find that it's very uh, price parity. If we put something online, a, a variety pack at $14.99 and it doesn't move, we put it at $14.99 at grocery, it doesn't move either. So if we can't make money or we can't get to the right price point on e-com that we can make money profitably at retail, you're probably not gonna be able to raise that price at retail and, and be able to make the money that you wanna make. How do you think about self-manufacturing versus co-manufacturing? When is the time, if ever, to self-manufacture if you start with a co-packer? How do you think about this in relation to exit process and do strategics prefer brands which with owned manufacturing? So it's interesting. I've, I've had both. Uh, I would say today, because supply chain is so difficult, Having alignment of interest with supply is so paramount and important. Um, my buddy, Chris uh, Mullen, who's the head of M&A of Hershey, one of the exciting things of buying a brand like Dots Pretzel was that they had supply chain and that they were able to buy their co-packer. Um, without that, you know, Chris didn't know where they were going to be able to continue to grow that brand that was moving so quickly. Um, a lot of times with my brands, and again, it becomes, you know, to me, alignment of interest is I would go to suppliers or I'd go to co-packers and other than just them making, you know, 10% or 20% on my product is what if they own two to 5% of my brand, right? Could you find more supply for me? Could you give me the right margins? And when you take them through the math of, okay, I'm a $3 million, $4 million brand today, but if I I sell for 100 or 200 million dollars, you know, and you are able to own 2% of my business to 4% of my business, that's two to four million dollars, which equates to them to putting a couple more lines into their plant or creating a model that allows them to bring in more emerging brands. Um, to me, is much more exciting than working with a co-packer who's just trying to build a transactional relationship. And as commodities change, they just keep raising prices on you versus understanding that if your velocity slow down, that means that their lines slow down. So if both of you understand that, hey, we both can eat during this process, but we can all share a really great dinner at the end, um, to me is a much more exciting approach. So it doesn't mean that every co-packer does that or every supplier want to do that but when you find the ones that do um they seem to want to grow or invest in more lines or do things because now they see that there is a real chance at the end 
that they're going to get a nice check alongside you when this whole thing comes to uh, comes to an end of your journey with the brand. So, I guess to answer that question today, if if you can figure out how to get supply chain excited, um, it's a very important area for both you know you, but also your investors today and your future investors to know that you've got a real solid partner that also is got skin in the game with you and your investors. That's a great segue into our next question, which is what's a positive approach to finding private equity for angel investors? Mm. I always say alignment of interest on that one. Uh, Jordan, don't laugh. Uh, I love Jordan White's. Uh, so you have to make sure at the end of the day that you have people on your cap table or investors that really understand your roadmap, your journey, can answer the questions and make you feel comfortable. I can't tell you how many times when I was a founder or when I speak to a founder that they are deathly afraid to tell their investors or their private equity what's really going on in their mind. They just raised money and they're going in this direction and they see their first data points and they're like, shit, I got to change my packaging or do something. But if I tell my private equity or my investors that they're going to fire me or they're going to replace me with somebody else. Typically, when I come on or, or, or individuals like myself, we've made every mistake that you've made and probably even more. And what I find is that there's open dialogue. You know, my job and others like me and firms like mine is to give you, you know, the advice and also our contacts to help fix a problem, not hire a consultant to watch you that's reporting to me, but to find somebody who can actually make your business better. So I wouldn't necessarily take the cheapest money out there or the easiest money. Uh, to me, what was most important to my journey was finding people that I was comfortable enough to talk to when I had a problem or when I was having a success and they could speak freely and tell me how things went when they were doing it in my seat. Um, a lot of private equity guys will say, you know, they'll mention brands that they've been a part of, but at the end of the day, they've met the brand maybe four to six times a year on, on, um, on either conference calls or board meetings, but they never really dealt with the day to day. And as a founder, you really need people that know the day-to-day -day, um, uh, opportunities that are going to fall either in your lap or the ones that you've lost and that you need to bring back into your lap. The other thing that uh, is really important um, is a lot of times, and this happened to me as an early founder, is holy shit, you know, everyone owns a whole bunch of this company and I'm working my tail off and at the end, uh, I just assume everyone's going to do right by me and give more of my company back or give me a bonus. And I think if you ask 99% of the successful founders out there, they'll tell you that doesn't happen. Um, and it's always most important in the early stage is to make sure that whatever law firm or legal firm you're using, that you put things out there that if things go really well, and I'm doing what's best for the business, that there are metrics to give you back parts of your company, whether it's through profit interest, whether it's through milestones, um, so that you can feel at the end that you've gotten a, a decent you know, shave. Every investor will look at the end and say, you got what you deserved, um, you did a great job, and look, I'm sorry, you only own 2% or 4% of your business, but you know, we took all the risk. You mean you took all the risk? I took all the risk. I was the one there every day. My team was there every day. So a lot of times, and, and I had a great investor early on when I was with Veggie Straws and we were growing so fast and there were, it was kind of coming to the time that we're in now where money became really dry for equity and you know debt structures and you know, really vulture capital came in to try to, you know, even good companies were getting squeezed with, with bad economics on, on uh, opportunities to put money in your company was, you know, they looked at me and said, you know, we're going to buy out all your bad investors. 
And right now you only own, make up a number, you own 12% of your business. But if you sell the business for 70 million, we're going to give you 3% of your company back. You sell the business for 80 million, we're going to give you 5% of the company back, all the way up to about 25% of the company back because they recognize that for them and their investors, once they made past the three or four X, they did everything right that their investors expected them to do. And they got me all excited that if I got them a three or four X that I can get a lot more of my company back. So all of a sudden I'm re-engaged, I'm more excited. The alignment of interest is truly there. And at the end of the day, I got them their, their three X and they got me 15% of my company back in my hands, right? And after that, I wanted to do more things with them. And as I invest in other, other founders going forward, I put those things in front of them. And if they had people on their cap table that said that's not fair or that's not the way things are done, they're probably not the investors who are going to do the right thing at the end. So it's better for you to know that now versus waiting to the end and hoping they're going to do something right. Um, let's see here. Next question. Uh, who would, would love to hear recent examples of brands that put your eye, did that. Um, anyone want to unmute themselves? I think we've lost um, Adrian and ask another question. Hey, Jason, can I ask a question? Sure. Hey, um, you, you sent you said uh, 10 to 15% spend when you're approaching club with your veggie straws. Is that when you say 10 to 15% spend, was that for, uh, was that for slotting fees? Can you kind of walk through those kind of hidden costs of slotting and promotions and how you plan at, at an early stage? Sure. So club is a little different than grocery. So the, the benefit that you have, um, in club versus uh, retail is when you walk into retail, that slot is worth $20,000 to a retailer. So whether you're Kellogg's or you're Jason Cohen, you know, if you want that, that spot, you're gonna pay 20 grand. And after six months, if your velocities aren't there, they're gonna keep your 20 grand and sell that space to somebody else. The way club works is, everyone's on the same playing field. So it doesn't matter how many dollars a Kellogg's or a Frito or someone walks into Costco and says, I'm gonna give you $2 million in promotions. They don't care about that. What they care about is that one slot in their store has to do around 12 to $1,500 a week per store per minimum, which the average store for the same product in a traditional grocery store is maybe 10 to $30 per week per store. So the benchmark of success in club is significantly higher than it is in grocery. However, instead of having 2,700 snacks in club, they have maybe 12 to 15. So they look for products that have real differentiation. Their members are paying a club membership. So they're looking for things that they traditionally either can't find or they're looking for things that they can find at a better value on some of the more established brands. So club looks for things that they can create that will give consumers a reaction that, wow, I didn't know this existed. You don't have to have a brand. You just have to have something that they believe, whether it's using a certain new type of syrup or a new type of sugar or a new type of um, uh, way to deliver a potato chip, that would make that consumer want to try it. And the difference between club and retail is that they have these things called demos. And the demos, which you pay for, are part of that 10% or 15% spend that you use. And that will give you a good indication as well as the buyer as to whether or not the consumer really wants to buy your product. So a good product at Costco um, will do anywhere from three to $500 a day on that demo. So a demo will cost you around two to $225 for the day. They have their own people that do it. Um, so the benefit is one is you get to make money on demo day, which at a traditional uh, retailer, you don't. 
Um, you get results right away. So if you're not doing between 250 to 500, that means there's either something wrong with your product, there's something wrong with the price, or the product just wasn't that important to the consumer at, at that particular store. Once you start seeing those results and you're saying, okay, I could do 250 to $500 a day on a demo, and you know that the threshold is $1,500 a week per store, they have a finite amount of people who have a membership that go to that store, and they usually only go to that particular Costco or that Sam's or BJ's every single month. And they usually go once every two weeks. So if you do demos twice a week for the next eight weeks, you'll capture 60 to 70% of that consumer. And if that consumer likes your product, they're coming back and buying without that demo. So as you progress along within club, your demo spend should be able to go down because you've captured so many of those consumers throughout those first eight to 12 weeks. And that's when the buyers start to see that, okay, so your demos are going like this up and down, and now your business is starting to just naturally progress up. And now you're spraying demos more like once every two weeks versus once every week to try to establish uh, opportunity. And just because you know you do this for six to eight weeks and they tell you that they're rotating you out doesn't mean that you didn't do well. A lot of times on small or new brands, they purposely take you out for four months or so so that when that consumer sees your product again, now they buy three or four bags at the same time because they're scared that you're gonna be gone again in the next six or eight weeks. And they may purposely do that for your first year or two to try to really establish whether or not the consumer wants to see this on an everyday basis. I don't know if that helps. Hi there. Very helpful. Thank you. Sorry, I had a spotty connection for a minute. So That's I, okay. I connect, but I'm glad you guys were able to continue to connect. Um, did anybody else have another question they would like to ask Jason? Uh, I did have I'm, one from, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Dan with Vibol Energy Team. I just had a question if you had any advice for early stage solo founders on team building and bringing on the right partners uh, internally early on. Yeah, so I would tell you, especially with beverage, what I've learned is, you know, and I always talk about relationships, but the beverage business is such a strong, I would say, you know, I use the word good old boy, where you've got a lot of DSD, old school um, organizations that are very expensive to operate. They require high velocities. Uh, they require a lot of commitment and dollars up front from founders. And when they see someone that they've never met before who doesn't have any teammates that they know, they shy away only because they don't have really a lot of time to educate them. And they're also scared that they'll start building this thing and you'll go out of business. And it's really expensive for them to then go replace that on shelf with something else. So what I have learned, and even with my you know, pedigree and what I have done, when I walked into a lot of those guys, they would say, great, you really know snacks, but what do you know about beverage? And then I started to hire, same way that I was telling you guys in the beginning, I'd walk into those distributors and say, so who did your team work best with on some of the other brands? And I went, you know, and I hired a number of those people. And when those people were hooked into those DSD, it's like, oh, we're back again. We're going to do this again. You know, they understand which guys in the organization know how to pull the right strings. And the organization all of a sudden like sees real opportunity again. Um, so it's really important that as you start to build culture as a, as a, as a, a new emerging brand, that you align yourself with who was the best four or five people in the tea business that you can, uh, you can bring on to your team and give them a piece of that company. Or maybe they made a ton of money in their last one and they now have a couple bucks and they want to write a check. So now when you're going out to investors, you can say, I've got Andrea, she just came off of Vitacoco and they went public and she's got 
you know, 1,500 accounts that she worked with, and she's got 27 people that reported into her. And if we raise the right amount of money, she's going to be able to do her job. And you can focus on the things that you do really well, which is probably creating innovation and, and building the brand story. But you're relying on people that really know what they're doing at the actionable spots that you're putting them versus you spending too much time trying to learn something from people who might not give you the proper attention yet. Okay. I had a question. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you for your time. What would be keeping you up at night if you were starting a brand tomorrow? Um, what would what would be maybe making you think you should pause versus continue to go, um, given the macroeconomic backdrop and what's going on in the economy? Yeah, I think, Justin, I think that's a great question. One is, um, you know, make sure that you're raising the right amount of money. Make sure that you're providing the proper valuation so that you can get the money. And what I tell people is it doesn't necessarily matter what you own today. It matters what you own at the end. So if you can align yourself, like I mentioned, with, you know, you're taking a lot of risk. I get it. I'm new. I've got this in a couple of Whole Foods. I feel like I've got momentum. And you give somebody or, or a group of people a great valuation with this caveat. If I get to 15 million in sales or I get to this, I'd like to be able to get some of that back, right? So that now I can go out and raise additional capital and not be as diluted as I was in that first round, but still leave you with a whole chunk of equity that you got, but with some of it coming back to me because I did what I needed to do. Um, and in this trying time, I had to maybe give away more than I did. But it gives um, it gives that right alignment of interest and trust that your early investors are going to be there for you, right? They're not going to just be like, okay, well, you know, shame on you, I got lucky, right? So, number one's that. Number two and three is, as I mentioned in the beginning of the call, is people are going to look at not only what your liquid or your product tastes like or your packaging looks like, but what type of team did you build? You know, what are the type of people that are that you've surrounded yourself that are going to help mentor and ensure your success? You wouldn't go to a Yankee game and pay for those seats if the Steinbretters hired the worst pitchers. And you can argue that maybe they did on those last couple of games. But, um, you know, people would stop coming to watch the Yankees. Right. So I always tell people is hire people with this objective. If the best person in your industry costs 250,000, hire them. Hire them with this caveat. You told me that you've got these four or five retailers in the bag. I'm giving you four months to do that. If you can't achieve certain results in four months, I gotta let you go. Because I can afford to pay you at your salary rate for four months, but after four months, if you can't show progression or proof of your own concept, I got to let you go. And if the person takes that job, then they've probably already done their diligence like you are, and they call three or four of their customers, and they, they know they have this in the bag. The ones that walk away are the ones that maybe bullshitted their way through the interview and don't really have the connections or the techniques that you're really looking for as an early stage. This is not a comfort zone. This is not a guaranteed bonus type of proposition organization. This is a early stage survive or die moment in my life. I either left a great job or I just had kids and I need to make this work. You need everyone in your organization to understand that every hour of the day of an early stage business has to show results. And don't be afraid to tell people that if the results aren't there, I can't, I can't wait any longer because I'm getting diluted, you're getting diluted. And if I run out of that first $3 million and I raise that this and I don't show proof, my next $3 million is going to be even worse than it was the first three. So it's really important when you first raise that first dollars that you've either given away some of that equity to some really great people in the industry that now wanna do this alongside you. Some of the best people that I've hired 
is like that number three or number four person at an organization. The person's boss made $10 million on the sale of that company and they made 250 grand. They probably did more work than their boss. Their boss just got lucky that they were there first. And they know just as hard if they work the next time and they're working for you, they can make the 10 million. They don't have to work any different, but now their, uh, their upside is much different. They've now tasted it. They now know it's real. They know they have the confidence to do that. Find those people in operations, find those people in sales, find those people in marketing and sell your dream. Sell to them that at the end of the day, I am not the only person walking away with a big check. I want a team. I want partners. I want people around me that can change not only my life, but can change yours as well. I think we have time for one more question. Um, one of our participants here is pre-launch right now, and she's just looking for advice on how to strategize within the first 12 months after launch date. You know, should there be more focus on D2C, Amazon retail? Um, she's looking to implement, a, I'm sorry, launch a shelf-stable cooking base that basically makes it easier for people to cook Indian food at home. So she's really um, just starting to get her plan together and was curious what you would advise. Yeah, I would say first is foremost is to find out whether it's a hobby or it's a business, right? Is this something that's scalable uh, where it requires, in, you know, where it makes sense to take investors money because this is big enough that there could be a return? Um, is there enough profit in there if it's not big enough to build it as a brand to sell? Is there enough profit in there to make distributions or give people their loans back? Um, is there communities within the social world that you can do within chat groups to find out whether or not this is something that is really needed? Um, a lot of people um, in different industries do pre-sales, right? They tell people what's coming and they see how many people are interested, right? You know, you just like a talk like this, how many people really give a shit what you have to say, you find out pretty quickly, right? So first and foremost is to find out whether or not what you're about to launch is a business or a hobby. Um, and from there, you'll know exactly what you need to do. Thank you, Jason, so much. Like truly appreciate you sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. Um, for everyone on the call, just dropped in the chat, stay connected with Jason, his email address and LinkedIn um, URL there. This has been great. Um, thank you again so much. This is just the beginning of our Meet the Founder series. So you'll be seeing a lot of these roll out in the coming months. Um, always looking for suggestions and we will be sending a survey. Would love your insights on how you felt the session. And I'll just say one more thing, you know, it is tough out there. It's always great to have people around you that have either done it before or are in it with you. Um, being a, a sole practitioner or, or doing these journeys solely on your own, you know, is, is really tough. And if there's ever a day or a night or a moment, you know, as Adrian said, you have my email, you have my, um, my LinkedIn. If I can answer a quick question, a lot of times it's just me pointing to the right person that I know that can, that can give you the right answer. And, once you realize that that is what you need, having people like myself around you so that when you're having a tough day, can either tell you about tough days that they had or give you people around them that um, can solve your riddle. Um, and this whole game that we play is just a riddle that at, you know, when I look at all the great successful guys and gals in this industry, they're the ones that have the great relationships. You're not going to do everything right. Um, and you're going to apologize more than you're going to clap. But as long as you do those things, as long as you don't run away from a mistake, as long as you're transparent. I walk into any retailer and they ask me what we're doing in the other retailer. I tell them because I want them to be as successful as we are. And one other tidbit that, I, that I've done is I've walked into retailers and I've sold other brands that I don't own. And they'll look at me and say, Jason, why are you talking about, you know, pretzel crisps or food should taste good or Stacy's, you know, which are all the brands that started when I did. And I would say, well, those are great brands and they're across the street. 
And if you want my brand to be successful, then we have to build a block of great innovative brands within your set. And one brand is not going to do it for you. So if I gave them Pretzel Chris or I gave them Pirate's Booty and they became bigger or better brands at the time than mine, well, am I just a brand or am I also a feeder of great opportunity? So once they kick me out, will they continue to get that insider innovation or intel that I'm learning through the course of my journey? So don't be afraid to brag or talk about things that you think are really good within your categories, because not everyone's going to drink the same water every day. Not everyone's going to eat the same Indian food or, or bars. But if culturally they're all looking for new innovation, then build a great innovation of products that people are going to drive people to that area. So one day they may be buying your product, the next day someone else's, and then maybe other days they're buying both but you're building a destination within the store that's going to force people to look for products just like yours. Great advice. Everybody have a, have a great day. I really, I really enjoyed this. I hope everyone did as well. And uh, thanks for making me not feel so old. Thank you, Jason. Thank you everyone for joining again today. We'll be in touch for the next one. Thank you. Have thanks all.